Hello friends, welcome to Shankar IAS Academy Daily Newspaper Analysis. Today's date is 26-3-2024. Behind me are the list of articles that we are about to discuss today. So without much delay, let's get started. Look at this article. More than two years after climate negotiation attempted to phase out coal from global energy mix, it is back with a bang. This article traces the reason for China's energy insecurity, rising India's demand and fallout of other fossil fuel due to Russia-Ukraine war, etc. Though these are the crux of this article, in our today's discussion, let us see about the most often repeated topic for UPSC prelims, that is coal. So let's get started. Coal is a black or brownish black sedimentary rock. It is composed mainly of carbon and hydrocarbon. Know that it contains huge energy that can be released through a combustion process to generate electricity. Currently, coal is the largest source of energy for generating electricity in the world. From Indian perspective, we are the second largest producer and consumers of coal after China as per financial year 2022. And also it is important to know that according to Ministry of Coal, major production of electricity is achieved through coal-based thermal power plant which is around 75% of total power generation. In this aspect, it is important to know that the guidelines for importing coal and coking coal. As per the present import policy, coal can be freely imported under open general license by the consumers themselves considering their need based on their commercial prudence. Coking coal is being imported by Steel Authority of India Limited SAIL, and other steel manufacturing units mainly to bridge the gap between the requirement and indigenous availability and to improve the quality. Know that coking coal or metallurgical coal is a bituminous coal with a suitable quality that allows for the production of metallurgical coke. Coking coal has a higher carbon content than seam coal as well as lower sulphur, phosphorus and alkalis. Moving further, let us understand some distinct characteristics of Indian coal. The most significant characteristics of Indian coal is its high ash content which varies from 35 to 45 percent compared to other parts of the world which is around 15 percent. However, in Indian coal, sulphur content is low about 0.5 percent only. Moving further, let us see the types of coal and its distribution in India. Here note that coal is classified based on the amount of carbon content present in it. There are majorly four types of coal such as anthracite, bituminous, lignite and peat. Now let us see them one by one. First one is anthracite coal. It is the best quality coal with a carbon content up to 80 to 95 percentage. It is also called as carboniferous coal. In India, we have only a limited anthracite coal deposits. It is mainly found in Jammu and Kashmir region. Secondly, let us see about bituminous coal. The carbon content of bituminous coal varies from 40 to 80 percentage. It is also known as Goldwana coal. Note that about 80 percent of the coal deposit in India is of bituminous type. States such as Jharkhand, West Bengal, Odisha, Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh have bituminous deposits. Now let us take lignite. Lignite is crumbly brown rock or called as brown coal. Lignite coal is a low grade coal. Its carbon content is around 25 to 35 percentage. It retains more moisture than other types of coal. This makes it expensive and dangerous to mine, store and even to transport. In India, tertiary lignite is mainly found in Assam, Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Nagaland, Tamil Nadu, Pondicherry and Gujarat. The last one is peat coal. It is the lowest grade coal. It has lot of moisture and impurities. So when we burn peat, it leaves large amount of ash behind. In India, peat is found in Nilgiri Hills and Jhelum Valley of Jammu Kashmir region. Now with this, let us move on to one more important and most related concept that is coal gasification. See, it is a thermochemical process that converts coal into a synthesis gas or syngas by reacting coal with oxygen, seam or a combination of both at a high temperature and pressure. Moreover, this gas is used instead of piped natural gas, methane and others for deriving energy. In this juncture, we shall see a brief on syngas. See, synthesis gas or syngas is a mixture of methane, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, carbon dioxide and water vapor. Moreover, it can be used to produce a wide range of fertilizer, fuels, solvents and synthetic materials etc. That's all about this discussion. With this, let's move on to our next analysis. Look at this article. The prestigious award for Carnatic music, the Sangeetha Kalanidhi Award, is given to T.M. Krishna. This article talks about the contributions and the significance of this award. In this context, let us learn about Carnatic and Hindustani music, which is certainly more important for prelims and mains 2024. 
C. Carnatic and Hindustani music are two distinct classical music traditions in India. While they share same similarities, they also have significant differences in them of their origin, style, techniques and performance practices. Let us discuss how Carnatic music is different from Hindustani music. Firstly, about origin. Carnatic music originated in the southern regions of India, particularly the Dravidian states of Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Karnataka and Kerala. Hindustani music originated in the northern regions of India, primarily in the states of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra. Secondly, about style and structure. Carnatic music is known for its intricate melodic pattern, rhythmic complexity and emphasis on improvisation within a structured framework called ragas and talas. Hindustani music is characterized by the use of ragas and talas as well, but it tends to have more free-flowing and improvisational nature compared to Carnatic music. Thirdly, about instruments. See, both the traditions use similar instruments such as sitar, tabla, flute and violin. However, there are also instruments unique to each tradition. For example, mridangam and veena are predominantly used in Carnatic music, while the sornod or santur are more common in Hindustani music. Fourthly, about vocal styles. Both traditions place great emphasis on the vocal music. In Carnatic music, the vocal style tend to be more ornamented and emphasized precise articulation of notes. Whereas Hindustani vocal styles often incorporates elaborate ornamentation and slides between the notes known as meend and gamak. Fifthly, about the language used. Carnatic music compositions are predominantly in Sanskrit and Telugu, whereas Hindustani composition are often in the languages such as Hindi, Urdu and Persian. In performance context, Carnatic music is traditionally performed in a concert setting called Kacheri in India, where the main performer, usually a vocalist or instrumentalist, is accompanied by violinist, Mirandangam player and sometimes other precautionists. Hindustani music performances often take place in more intimate settings such as Baitax or Mafal where the audience is closer to the performer and the atmosphere is more informal. Lastly, about the Garnas. Hindustani music has a tradition of Garna or schools, which are a lineage of musical teaching and performances. Each Garna has its own distinct style. Carnatic music also has its own lineage and style known as Sambradaya, but they are not as prominent or structured as a Garna system in Hindustani music. Despite these differences, both Carnatic and Hindustani music are deeply rooted in Indian classical tradition and share a common foundational principle such as use of ragas, talas and improvisational to express emotion and spiritual themes. With this, let's move on to see Purandar Dasa, who is considered as a father of Carnatic music. Purandar Dasa was a Carnatic composer and a singer from Karnataka. His period is between 1484 to 1564. Purandar Dasa belonged to Vaishnava tradition during Vijayanagara rule. He was one of the chief proponent of Carnatic music. He was a follower of Madhavacharya's Dvaita philosophy. He composed songs in Kannada and Sanskrit. That's all for this discussion. Let's move on to the next. Look at this article providing data point highlighting a critical water scarcity situation in the southern states. This news is concerning since the summer is around the corner. However, as summer approaches, concerns about glacial lake outburst flooding GLOF has also resurfaced. So in this news article discussion, let us go through GLOF in detail with the main science writing approach. Let me read out the question for you. Discuss the causes, impact and mitigation measures associated with glacial lake outburst floods in the context of mountainous region. How can governments and communities effectively manage the risk posed by GLOF? This question can be asked in GS Paper 3 under the syllabus Disaster Management. So in the introduction part, you can give some facts about GLOF. Then you can split the main body of the answer into two parts. First. You can write about the causes and impacts associated with GLOF and then you can write about the mitigation measures. This is how we are going to address this particular question. In the introduction part, you can write that flash floods caused by the outburst of glacial lakes is called glacial lake outburst floods that is GLOF. The glacial lake are common in the high elevation of glaciated basins. They are formed when glacial ice or the moraines or natural depression impound water. This glacial lake is contained and regulated by dams. However, failure of these ice or moraine dams leading to disastrous destruction events. One such event is GLOF. They have immense potential of flooding in downstream areas causing disastrous consequences due to the release of large volume of water in very short interval of time. Indian Himalayan region contains the world's largest number of glaciers and snow outside the polar region and so aptly called as third pole of the world and are more prone to glacial lake outburst flood GLOF. Have a look at the stats and the figures given here. 
you can write these points in the introduction part and mention these figures and data in the side moving on to the first part of the body here you can write the causes impacts and mitigation measures associated with gloef first we shall see about the causes some of the natural causes are as follows volcanic or geothermal activity can cause the rapid melting of glaciers that can burst their natural dams seismic activity like earthquake can cause a rupture of natural dams holding back glacial lakes resulting in the floods downstream avalanches and landslide can create natural dams but they are only temporary in nature they can be breached easily by water accumulation or seismic activity then glacial moraine failure can cause gloef see glaciers often deposit rock and sediments known as moraines along their edges these moraines can form natural dams that can hold glacial lakes failure of these moraines due to erosion overtopping or other causes can lead to gloef apart from this glacier surging glacial lake overtopping glacial calving and extreme weather events can lead to gloef here a surge is a sudden acceleration of glacial flow creating new glacial lakes or expanding existing ones glacial lake overtopping happens when glacial lakes water level rises too high it can overtop the natural dam leading to its erosion and even full failure glacial calving is the breaking of a ice chunk from the front of a glacier these ice chunk can fall into glacial lake creating waves damaging the natural dam some of the anthropogenic causes includes glacial retreat due to climate change for example in 1994 a glacial lake outburst flood occurred in bhutan where lutso burst its bank this event highlighted the vulnerability of the region to climate change and glacial melting then human activities like mining construction and other forms of development in mountainous areas can cause destabilization of slopes and increase the likelihood of landslide or avalanches leading to gloef then right about the impacts of the event change in albedo the presence of glacial lake can alter the reflectivity of the ice surface dark colored lakes absorb more solar radiation compared to the surrounding ice leading to increased melting at glacial surface this process can accelerate ice melting and contribute to glacial retreat gloef can cause significant environmental damage including erosion of river banks loss of vegetation and disruption of ecosystem sediment and debris carried by flood waters can smother aquatic habitats and degrade water quality downstream this affects both biodiversity and ecosystem services gloef can damage critical infrastructures like hydropower plants irrigation system and transportation networks the loss or impairment of these infrastructure system can have cascading effect on the regional economies and development efforts for example recently occurred gloef event at chungtang in sikkim due to bursting off at south lonak lake with this you can conclude the first part of the answer and move on to the second part of the answer here you can write about the mitigation measures that can be taken by the government and the communities to effectively manage the risk posed by gloef one of the most promising option for efficient and effective disaster risk management is the implementation of early warning system for this potentially dangerous lakes can be identified based on the field observation and records of past events and these potentially dangerous lakes can be kept under advanced monitoring system and this can direct potential glo of triggers and provide timely warnings to the downstream community secondly channeling potential floods this can be done by reducing the volume of water with various controlled breaching pumping or symphoning out water and making a tunnel through a moraine barrier thirdly implementing uniform codes for construction activity a hazard map can be developed for this purpose and a land use regulation can be implemented to ensure that vulnerable areas near glacial lake are not densely populated or used for critical infrastructures then encouraging construction of buildings and infrastructures that can withstand gloef this may include elevated homes flood resistant bridges and protective dams where necessary traditional alarming infrastructure can be replaced with a classical alarm infrastructure it can include acoustic alarms by sirens and can use modern communication technology using cell and smartphones as complementary finally establishing clear evacuation routes and conducting regular drills can ensure the communities are prepared to respond quickly when a glo of warning is issued you can write about these points in the second part of the answer moving on to the conclusion part here you can write that the ndma guideline suggests that risk reduction can be done by identifying and mapping potentially dangerous lakes taking structural measures to prevent their sudden breach and establishing mechanism to save lives and property in time of a breach by following these guidelines and implementing comprehensive risk reduction measures government and communities can effectively manage the risk posed by gloef and mitigate their potential impacts on vulnerable mountainous region that's all about this answer let's now move on to the next
Look at this news article. The maiden auction for the critical minerals by the center has faced a setback. It is because close to seven blocks, including lithium in Jammu Kashmir, have no active participations to bid. These seven blocks contain critical minerals like gluconate, graphite, nickel, platinum group elements, potash, lithium and titanium. This is the crux of the article. In our analysis, let us see about the major minerals and its regulation in India from prelims perspective. Firstly, what is mean by major minerals? Major minerals are the minerals which are specified in the list or the schedule first of the Mines and Minerals Amendment Act, MMDRA 1957. See, there is no official definition for major minerals in the act. Hence, whatever is not declared as a minor mineral may be treated as a major mineral. Moreover, the power to frame law for major minerals is dealt by the Ministry of Mines under the central government. Now, I am displaying the list of major minerals. Have a look at it and revise as questions were being asked directly from it. Now, having seen the list of major minerals, now let's see the regulation behind it. As we have already seen, the power to frame law with respect to major minerals is dealt by Ministry of Mines. Whereas with respect to minor minerals, the central government has the power to notify minor minerals under MMDR Act. But the power to frame law for minor minerals is entirely delegated to state government. Thus, the administrative and regulatory jurisdictions of minor minerals falls under state government. Before finishing our discussion, let us see about lithium reserves in India. According to Indian Mines Ministry, the government agencies made a small discovery of lithium resource at a site in Mandya, Karnataka. It is the country's first lithium reserve. Moreover, lithium-inferred resources have been found in Riyasi districts of Jammu Kashmir. That's all about this discussion. Let's move on to our next. This news article talks about a campaign named Save Kodagu and Kaveri. This campaign fights against unchecked commercial land conversion and urbanization of Kodagu. As you all know, Kodagu is where Thala Kaveri or River Kaveri originates. So, this land conversion could affect the principal catchment of this area. Environment Ministry have cited this as one of the major reasons for the water shortages in Bengaluru. This is the crux of this news article. In this context, let us quickly go through the causes for Bengaluru water crisis this year. Let us see them one by one. Like most other parts of the country, Karnataka receives bulk of its annual rainfall during the monsoon. And it is this water that fills up the reservoir and recharges the aquifers. During last year's monsoon, Karnataka received rainfall that was 18% below normal. When this rainfall deficit is combined with falling reservoir level, it is normal to face water stress. The major water reservoirs of Krishnaraj Sagar and Kobini that feeds Bangalore along with other dams and reservoirs in the state have live storage of up to 20% of their capacity. In this given situation, the state has just enough water for drinking to last for one season only. Second factor is encroachment of natural water bodies. The concrete jungle that Bangalore is converting into is at a cost of its beautiful water bodies. As urban development encroaches upon water bodies, it disrupts local ecosystem, diminishes biodiversity and exacerbates water scarcity issues. Then, over-exploitation of groundwater. With the natural water bodies being encroached, the only source of water available in most part of the city is groundwater. The population is dependent on it for drinking, washing and landscape management too. The available water is not reused enough and wasted in drains. Again, this leads to water scarcity. Then, depletion of water level in borewells. Borewells are now dug as deep as 800 to 900 feet in search of water. Whereas a couple of decades ago, it was common to find water at a depth of 150 to 200 feet. Finally, the lack of widespread water utility service in the city. See, the BWSSB has still not been able to lay its water pipes in the outer zones of Bangalore. The worst hit among these areas are Bellandur, Singhasandra, Ramurti Nagar, Bayantarayanapura, Jakur, Devanabisana Halli. These areas are highly dependent on tank water supply. In essence, reliance on over-exploited groundwater, limited access to pipelines, neglected lake maintenance and underutilization of water treatment facilities are contributing to severe water shortage in the city. That's all about this discussion. Let's move on to our next. Look at this article. This article talks about the rising imports of steel, the slowdown of local demand ahead of Lok Sabha polls, which are a cause of worry for Indian steel makers. The data shows that the import from China has surged 88% in April to February period of the current financial year, which has majorly impacted domestic steel players. This is the crux of this article. In our discussion, let us see about two important topics which are most important for this year's preliminary exam. They are trends in India's iron and steel market and Darwar and Gondwana rock system in India. Now let us see about the trends in iron and steel industries in India. According to the India brand Equity Foundation, a trust of Ministry of Commerce, India is the world's second largest producer of crude steel. 
the output of India is 125.32 metric ton of crude steel and finished steel production of 121.29 metric ton in the financial year 2023. Moreover, it is estimated that India's steel production will grow at 4 to 7 percentage in the financial year 2024. Know that the growth in the India's steel sector has been driven by domestic availability of raw materials such as iron ore and cost-effective labor. Consequently, it has been a major contributor to India's manufacturing output. In the past 10-12 years, India's steel sector has expanded significantly. Production has increased by 75 percentage since 2008. Know that the domestic steel demand has increased by almost 80 percentage. This scenario is under scanner recently as India's imports from China surged to 88 percentage in April to February period of the current financial year 24. Moreover, imports from Asian countries has also been on sharp rise. But the various experts says that this is a temporary phenomenon and the country will bounce back its production. Now let us see the second topic of the day, Darwar and Gondwana rock system in India. First let us see about Darwar system of rocks. This rock system derives its name from the rocks in the Darwar district of Karnataka. Let us see the features of this rock in brief. Firstly, they are formed and deposited from 4 billion years ago to 1 billion years ago. The main feature of this rock system, it is highly metamorphosed sedimentary rock system. Know that they were formed due to metamorphosis of sediments of Archean Genesis and Cyst. The major types of rocks in this system are horn blade, cyst, quartzite, fillets, slates, crystalline limestone and dolomites. The geographical distribution of these rock system are in the areas of Darwar, Bellari, Mysore, Belt of Karnataka, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Odisha, Himalayan regions, etc. Finally, let us see the significance of this system. C. They possess valuable minerals like high-grade iron ore, manganese, copper, lead, gold, etc making the rock system a valuable one. Finally, we shall see in brief on Gondwana system. See, Gondwana system of rocks derives its name from Gonds, the tribal people of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh region. The various significance of this rock system can be stemmed from a fact that Gondwana rocks contains nearly 98% of India's coal reserves. Due to its young nature, vision with carboniferous coal whose carbon content is low. Also note that this system contains a rich deposit of iron ore, copper, uranium and antimony etc. The location and distribution of this rock system is depicted in the map given here. Please have a look. That's all about this discussion. In addition to the above articles that we have discussed today, there are two more important articles. One is Sordid Scheme. It came along the editorial section of the Hindu newspaper. It talks about electoral bonds. Another article is UNSC calls for ceasefire in Gaza. Understanding about the functions of UNSC and understanding the geographical significance of Gaza are important for this prelims. Since we have discussed enough in our previous discussion, please go through it. Let's now discuss today's practice question. Look at this question from 2023 prelims. With reference to the coal-based thermal power plant in India, consider the following statements. None of them uses sea water. None of them is set up in a water stress district. None of them is privately owned. How many of the above statements given are correct? Only one, only two, all the three, none. The correct answer is option D, none. Mudra thermal power station located in Gujarat uses sea water. Look at this question. Consider the following minerals. Bentonite, Chromite, Kyanite, Silimanite. In India, which of the above is or officially designated as major minerals? 1 and 2 only, 4 only, 1 and 3 only, 2, 3 and 4 only. And the correct answer is option D, 2, 3 and 4. Because Bentonite is not officially designated as a major mineral in India. Look at this question. Consider the following statements regarding Darwar rock system. Statement 1. Most ancient metamorphosed sedimentary rock system in the world. Statement 2. They are first studied in Darwar regions of Karnataka. Which of the statements given above are correct? 1 only, 2 only, both 1 and 2, neither 1 nor 2. Answer is option C, both 1 and 2. Behind me is the today's mains practice question. Interested candidates can write it in the comment section below. If you like this video, please do share and subscribe. Thank you.